The Hiller flying platform was built and flown to prove a technical concept still valid for future high-speed vertical takeoff aircraft. Although some Army aviation planners were interested in the remarkable aircraft as an observation vehicle, the flying platform was seen by Hiller Aircraft Corporation designers as a step toward creating augmented thrust for vertical takeoff high-speed vehicles. We're here at Sebring. I'm Dan Johnson, and I'm talking with Warren Novak today, who is going to educate me about something that, well, I've seen it on some video somewhere from maybe the Korean War era, but this isn't that. What are we looking at here, Warren? Well, it's a similar version of the flying platform that Miller built. Flying platform, that's the phrase I couldn't come up with. Right, and they built them and developed them for the Army and the Navy. Now, uh, it's my understanding, and I don't know if this is for a fact, that they felt they were too slow and they could shoot the soldiers off of them, so they didn't feel it was applicable to military use. So they flew them, but they didn't actually Absolutely. deploy them into a combat center. Right, or so then they, and they were slow, so then they developed a jet pack. Slow, you mean in movement across the ground? Horizontal movement. Okay, yes, sir. But vertical movement, they're fine. And uh, they're great for getting across ravines and so forth. But with the technology in 1949 and 1950, with cast iron motors and 550 pounds of plywood propellers and so forth, it just didn't seem like it would be feasible for the, for the services to use it. Although I think the Navy tried it afterwards. Because so they were 550 pounds empty weight. Empty weight. And what are you here? 278 pounds. Wow, so you cut it in half. Wow. Plus we have a lot more horsepower. They had 40 horsepower. Did they use two inches as well? Yes, they okay. did. Yes, did. And is that just for redundancy or is that for power or both? Or? It was to power both props. I don't think it was for redundancy. Um, okay, so one engine drives one prop, one engine drives the other. Is that how this Right, that's here? the way this one is set up. And I don't know if the camera can see down here. We've got a point of one prop. There's a big, wide prop here. Look at the, yeah. look at the, the production cord model, lines on that The production thing. models will have a lot smaller props. Oh, this they is, will, okay. This is my personal one. Ah, okay. And this was a prototype. But the personal, the, the development of the, of the production models will be somewhat different from this version. But uh, we had to put this together and get it to the show. We yeah, sure. to the show. I understand you haven't flown this particular one yet. No, it's when do you anticipate that happening? Probably in June. June, okay. Probably in June. So you got a little more development work to do. Right, and, you know, right. We've changed right. some, quite a few things. Uh, we've been using Harley Davidson parts, and uh, they're quite expensive. Yeah. And, They've uh, learned how to charge for that stuff. I yes, know, they so. have. So, so we're uh, we like the parts, but uh, I I want to be able to change the gear ratios. Uh, like on a 10-speed bike, uh, they're uh, able to change uh, gear uh, ratios. Uh, okay. Uh, I want to be able to do that. And with why the would you want to do that? What, what? Well, if a guy buys this and we don't furnish the engines, we just furnish the framework and okay. the bed of ductwork. If a guy buys this and he may want to put uh, his own, maybe a Triumph motorcycle engine on it. Okay. Okay. Uh, he might have to use a different gear ratio. These Rotex engines, which we would recommend, turn 6,000 RPM right around that continuously and produce about 52 horsepower this particular version. Which engine is this? This is the 503. 503. The 503. The 503. Okay. Now they produce a little over 50 horsepower, right. this particular one. We're very familiar with those from the ultralight world. Dave and I worked in the ultralight world right. for many, many years, so we know right. this engine. Right. Now, if a fellow wanted to bought one of these kits and he wanted to, say, use a motor out like a BSA or, or a Honda or whatever, uh, it may not develop. It may only develop 30 horsepower. So, so what do you do? Ah, okay. You then change the gear, the gear ratio. Now. Okay. So I want that availability. I want that uh, to be available to guys to go. Well, I need a smaller pulley to drive this faster. Or I want to change this. So pulley. you want to be able to offer some different parts to that. Absolutely. So you put your own engine on it, Absolutely. but we got the parts that'll work with that right. engine. Right. Think about a quick change for engines and race cars. They could change the gear ratio. Well, this track's shorter than this other track, ah, so we need to go to a lower okay. ratio. Okay. You know. So I want that to be an option. <laughs> Well, let's talk about the pilot side of it for, for a while. Okay. First of all, how do I even get in it? Just step on this and step right in. Step on this uh, sure. uh, oh, structural oh, okay. surface there. Yeah. And how do you get in it? Do you have to jump over the top no, or you no, work no, your way no. up? Yeah. Okay, let's show us. You can show us right here now. All right. Good. Captain of your world. If you can't get into this, you got no business. <laughs> okay. And then, how do you operate the thing? 
Well, we haven't. I see you don't have. You probably don't have controls right, on. Right. We didn't have time. What will you have when you're? What does the guy do when we'll, he's up there? We'll have a. We'll have two tachometers right here. Okay. We're That's the instrument panels. Yes, okay. sir. Yeah. Okay. To make sure the motors are running safe. And we'll have a throttle control. A few other instruments. Richard's doing the instrumentation on it. I'm out of that part of the loop. It keeps me away from there. But he's going to be handling the instrumentation, all the wiring. Richard used to do avionics for many years, and so he's very I, versed in that field. All right, how, so how do you, you control got, the aircraft when you're up there? Yeah, then? you got engine controls. Okay, you can change right. the speed of the engine. How do you... Right, what? it's a weight shift. Okay. Weight shift. All right, you just lead, kind of like a Segway. You sort of lead the way you want to go. That's right. And we're also going to incorporate a couple of ailerons in, in here on this, uh, on this segment. Now, how would an aileron work on this? Well, just like it works on an air, aircraft. You have a, a lever that you push like that. You want to go this way. You turn, turn it. That helps. That's an assist. Ah, it's an assist to the weight. You're going to do the weight shift too, but that's going to right. Kind of like a. Uh, I think that would be necessary. Spoiler. I think that's necessary, especially in wind conditions. I don't know that ah. the weight shift would be enough, but I, uh, with the aileron. Now this is going. So you'd have a. You'd be. You'd, you'd stand in it in sort of the same position all the time. Pretty much. And you would. That is forward to me, even though it's round. You right. know, just right. go backward. You can, I understand, but you typically would operate it in some direction. You relative. I would think you'd want to see where you're headed. <laughs> well, I would too, but hey, you know, different people want different things. Sure. So you got you got throttles for each engine. You got an aileron control. Uh, how do you manage all of that with your hands? Throttles, you're not going to be burying the throttle. You're going to put the throttle on. You're going to put the just like a big plane here. That's right. The throttles will be locked in a certain point. And uh, then you're going to start leaning or whatever, and you might have a lever, you know. So you would be standing this way. I'm sorry, we're backwards. You'd be standing this way. Control up around over here. Yeah. Okay, so your controls are going to be right here, you know. And really, and what uh, provides the stability to it? Okay, you get up there and you it's start inherently, leaning in a certain no, way. It's inherently stable. It wants to stay this way. You have to fight it out of that. Has, absolutely. Okay. Because of the, so because if you just of the, stop leaning all the way one way, stand up. You shouldn't have to lean much at all. Uh, okay. The counter rotation. Yeah, show, give me an example of what you expect in the way of actual motion. Okay, you're just going to lean up against the side of it. That's all. And, uh, and with, the, with the ailerons, it would assist you. The, the counter rotating props uh, makes it inherently stable. It acts as a gyroscopic action. Ah, okay. Which, okay. You, according to what everything that we've researched, you couldn't turn this over if you had to. Is that right? That, everything that we've researched. Fascinating. Now, you've not flown one of these before. Haven't Who's going to do the first one? Probably me, because I'm a <laughs> licensed pilot. And uh, uh, I hope the FAA does. Yeah. <laughs> does that give you any concern? <laughs> no, not, not what whatsoever. What do you, how, how would you go about it? Would you just sort of hop up and down a little bit? No, I would or? put a I'd put a two-foot tether on it. Ah, okay. Just get used to that. Just kind of like flying Get used to the power. power. Then I'd go with a four-foot tether, and everything works fine, and I'm going to cut it loose. <laughs> well, we're going to have to come back and check with Warren on this, but uh, I've asked you all the stupid questions I can think of to ask. That's probably the ones a lot of people are wondering. They're not I'm stupid. Hoping. They're not stupid. But, they're uh, very valid. Where do we go get more information for those that want it, and how do we get in touch with you? you got a web address? We have a website. Roger here can tell you about the website. All right. He set it up. What's the website, Roger? FlyingPlatformLLC.com. FlyingPlatformLLC.com. Okay. Well, usually I say at the end of these videos that I've got other information about these on my website, but I can't do that because I've never even seen one of these in the fiberglass and aluminum before, I guess, instead of the flesh. But I'll, eventually I'll have something that'll be available on ByDanJohnson.com or BYDanJohnson.com. Thanks a lot for joining us here at Seabrook. This is the Hillier Flying Platform. In the 1950s, the military was looking for new forms of personal transport, and a series of devices, all with a touch of Buck Rogers about them, were developed. They were intended to take individuals to the battlefront in an entirely new way. The Hillier Flying Platform, together with several other similar concepts, was tested by the Office of Naval Research. The main virtue of the Hiller concept was its simplicity of design and operation and it worked surprisingly well. The military envisioned observers flying out to the edge of enemy lines and then popping up from behind trees and over hills to get a brief glimpse of the tactical situation. They would then return to report on enemy activity. It's quite probable this objective could have been achieved 
and certainly many similar ideas were tested during the same period, yet none were ever adopted. It would have been a tough assignment, because troops traveling in this manner would present easy targets and would have little or no opportunity to protect themselves. Moreover, the prospect of an engine failure would be something that even the bravest soldier would prefer not to even contemplate. But still, the logistical advantages of being able to skim over battlefields, minefields, rivers and forests was very tempting to army planners. Apart from adjusting the relative speed of the machine's two engines, the operator's principal method of control was redistribution of his body weight over various parts of the platform. This caused the vehicle to move in the direction of the greatest load. Hiller's flying platform never quite made it. And in addition to its rejection by the military, it was a disappointment in civilian markets as well. Commercial flying platforms would have probably attracted a lot of interest from the more adventurous members of the general public. But a swarm of civilian flying platforms would doubtlessly have led to accidents. Because as easy as the platforms appeared to be to control, they needed the skill and discipline of an expert to operate safely. Even with a soldier firing from the platform, it's interesting to note just how stable it remained against the rifle's recoil. Ironically, it was the Hiller flying platform's high degree of inherent stability that ultimately killed the project. The problem was that the platform had a tendency to right itself. Going forward depended on the machine's continued lean in the direction of flight, but it constantly wanted to straighten up and this made it almost impossible to maintain a consistent heading.